On December 6, 1989, Mark Lapine shot to death 14 women at the Engineering School of the University of Montreal in Canada, the worst single-day massacre in Canadian history. More than three decades later, the anniversary of the shooting remains the occasion for alarmist claims about violence against women and the ritual shaming of every man. I'm Janice Fiamengo, and this is the Fiamengo File 2.0. In this video, I review the massacre and the reporting about it to show how, from the beginning, it became a pretext to reinforce and exacerbate anti-male propaganda, much of it having little or nothing to do with the gunman or his crime. Rather than seek to understand what happened on that December Day massacre commemorations, have spread misinformation about the prevalence and meaning of violence against women, smearing all men as potential murderers. Every year, the anniversary of the massacre is commemorated with articles and reflection pieces in mainstream media bearing angry titles like Let's Finally Call Violence Against Women What It Really Is, and suggesting that modern society has yet to grapple with the pervasiveness of hatred of women. In actuality, hatred of women quickly became the dominant, perhaps the only acceptable public explanation with the bloodthirsty gunman recruited as a stand-in for all men. The shaming of men certainly doesn't aid understanding of the murders, is certain to do nothing to prevent similar crimes in the future, and should not continue to direct public policy. Let's return to December 6, 1989. It was probably inevitable that the killings would be politicized. 25-year-old Mark Lapine, born Gamille Garby, had walked into the engineering school at the University of Montreal in the late afternoon. He entered a classroom, separated the men from the women, and began shooting women with a semi-automatic handgun. Stating that he hated feminists, he then moved up and down the halls in search of victims as students ran for cover. When he finally turned his weapon on himself, 14 women were left dead, 10 other women and 4 men injured. To clarify what he had done, Lapine left a suicide note explaining his rage, and he also appended a list, not released until many months later, giving the names of particular women he would like to have killed if he'd had time. In the suicide note, Lapine charged feminism with mass hypocrisy. He said that feminists wanted, quote, to keep the advantages of women while seizing for themselves those of men, end quote. He noted that feminists weren't interested in removing the male-female barrier in the Olympics, for example, which would have shut women out of medal contention in most sports. They were interested in so-called equality only when it benefited them as, for example, in war commemorations where women were honored as soldiers despite not having fought on the front lines. He particularly hated how feminists, quote, always try to misrepresent men every time they can, end quote. Even before the note's contents were revealed, most commentators ruled out of bounds the idea that Lapine was mentally ill or that his atrocious act was in any way exceptional. That was too easy, they insisted and was itself a kind of sexism. Martin Dufresne, identifying himself as a member of the Men's Collective Against Sexism, stated in a letter to the newspaper Le Devoir the day after the murders that, quote, the anti-feminism of the killer is strangely echoed by those who would again censor women by preventing them from seeing what everybody knows perfectly well. It was misogyny that struck Wednesday, not an incomprehensible act, end quote. If anyone had tried to prevent women from calling Lapines an act of misogyny, the censorship was spectacularly unsuccessful. Many declarations in the wake of the shooting alleged that Lapines' act was an instance of terrorism, logically planned and executed its purpose to make all women afraid. His choice of an engineering school was purportedly a warning to women entering masculine fields. If you attempt to usurp male authority, you will die. As feminist journalist Francine Peltier wrote for La Presse newspaper just a few days after the incident, quote, If this is madness, never has it been so lucid, so calculated, 
The message is there is a price for women's liberation, and the price is death, end quote. Quebec feminist poet Nicole Brossard, also in La Presse, claimed that every woman who mourned Lapine's victims knew that she herself had also, quote, been symbolically put to death, end quote. These were dramatic declarations that no man dared contradict. According to the story that would be repeated in the weeks to come, Lapine's act was not only a warning, but was also a bloody enactment of what was already happening to women every single day. In Brossard's words, it was part of, quote, the day-to-day -day struggle inflicted upon women by men's domination, end quote. Denise Villieu, in a letter to Le Devoir, summed it up as follows, saying, quote, most women know one thing only too well. It's open season on women all year long. Lapine thus became a symbol for male power over women and men's alleged culturally ingrained sense of entitlement. What is intolerable for some men today, wrote Peltier, is that some women dare to be unavailable. Another letter writer in Le Devoir claimed that every woman instinctively understood Lapine's reasons because she lived them. Quote, they are transmitted to her at birth by the fathers, the brothers, the husbands who find it normal to subject her to their will and their desires. The idea that most women in Canada are brutalized victims is a baseless exaggeration, but such rhetoric became the standard line about the massacre. Lapine's slaughter was not really unusual, the reasoning went, and it was an act of misogyny to say it was. It is true that men abuse and kill women every year in Canadian society. It is also true that women abuse and kill men every year, a fact that completely undermines the gender-based violence explanation favored by feminists. If women are killed by men because men have power, which is the feminist claim, how do we explain the men who are killed by women? In 1991, for example, two years after Lapine's act, according to Statistics Canada, 87 women were killed by their spouses as compared to 25 men, a not insignificant number. Two years later, it was 64 women compared with 24 men. And when it comes to non-lethal domestic violence, it is well known that women participate in hitting, punching, and kicking intimate partners at least as often as men do and for the same reasons. And not infrequently, violent women cause serious harm. Overall, men are far more likely than women to be homicide victims. In 2018, 484 men as compared to 163 women were murdered in Canada. Moreover, men kill themselves far more often than they kill women. These figures are worth pondering, not to minimize the horror of what happened at L'Ecole Polytechnique or any act of violence against women, but to provide context about the capacity of both sexes to cause harm and the shocking silence in our society about male victims. When Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau declared on December 6, last year, 2020, that, quote, the safety of women must be the foundation of any society, it was impossible not to notice the deliberate asymmetry. It's a national tragedy when women are killed, but men's lack of safety, including their staggering occupational injuries and deaths, is a normal part of life that no national leader publicly mourns. The shift towards seeing Mark Lapine as a symbol of male power occurred at the same time as the unhappy details of his real life were being airbrushed out of the picture. Few will be surprised to learn that when he was a child, his home life had been violent and unstable. His father, Rashid Garbi, an immigrant from Algeria, had a history of psychiatric illness. As Garby's business failed, he became more unpredictable and explosive. According to his ex-wife, Monique Lapine, in interview, he had beaten both her and their son, once, quote, slamming his son's face so hard the marks were there for a week, end quote. When Mark was seven, his parents divorced and his father disappeared from his life. Later, Lapine would take his mother's maiden name and change his first name to Mark in an act of defiant self-transformation. For three of his teen years, Lapine had a big brother, a volunteer mentor named Ralph, 
who also ultimately disappeared, possibly due to a conviction for sexual abuse of a boy in his care. It's not known if he might have abused Lapine as well. At 17, Lapine attempted to join the Canadian Armed Forces, but was rejected following his interview. It seems that Mark was looking for masculine mentorship and identity throughout his teenage years to no avail. He grew up a lonely, socially awkward boy, bullied by his peers and considered unattractive because he had bad acne. Even his younger sister taunted him about his alleged ugliness. The siblings lived mostly apart from their mother, who worked as a nurse administrator and left her children with relatives during the week. Though he was intelligent, Lapine abandoned or failed out of two post-secondary programs, one in pure sciences and the other in computer programming. He applied to study engineering at the University of Montreal, but was rejected. I have not been able to ascertain whether the University of Montreal was proactively recruiting female students in the same year it rejected Lapine. Many engineering faculties have made no secret of doing so over the decades. In the final year of his life, Lapine was working as an orderly at the same hospital, St. Jude de Laval, where his mother was director of nursing. Acquaintances found him odd and unlikable. Though his hostility towards feminism is undeniable, it certainly did not seem to spring from male privilege or even given that he was friendly with several women from a generalized misogyny. It's simply hard to imagine that Mark Lapine ever felt entitled to anything in his short, wretched life. But even his mother, Monique Lapine, in the first interview she granted in 2008, echoed the standard perspective on masculinity when she protested that, quote, it was not in my home that he was trained to be macho. He must have learned that in school or from the guys around him, or maybe it's a genetic thing, I don't know, end quote. Defending herself from all responsibility, she reached for the well-entrenched feminist idea that violence is caused by toxic masculinity, an innate male quality exacerbated in patriarchal culture, rather than childhood abuse. Back in 1989, commentators didn't want to extend any empathy to Lapine, and some seemed unwilling to let even completely nonviolent men off the patriarchal hook. For journalist Francine Pelletier, the massacre was not only every woman's tragedy, but every man's shame. Quote, the day men start saying that they too are afraid of this kind of behavior, that it hurts them too, that they don't want any more of it. That's the day when things will start to change, not before, end quote. Pelletier didn't clarify how men were to prevent random attacks like Lapine's, but the charge that all men were implicated in the violence was one that no man could easily refute and most didn't try. The rhetoric had moved quickly into irrational territory and stayed there. It is now commonplace to state that, quote, violence against women will not end until men are an active part of the solution, end quote. Yet if one wanted to create festering resentment in some number of men, one could do no better than to demand they accept moral responsibility for crimes they have not committed and which they are powerless to stop, and in recompense embrace laws and policies to advantage women at men's expense. Yet this was the precise route taken by the Canadian federal government, which commissioned a subcommittee to write a report, quote, inquiring into the causes of the problem of violence against women in Canadian society and the actions that government should take to combat it. As Paul Nathanson and Catherine Young explain, the report could have been given a very different mandate. It could have inquired into the causes of violence generally, recognizing that men are also victims. It could have inquired into the specific factors that produce mass school shootings. It could have affirmed that the demonization of men as a group was unacceptable. It could have asked what steps a society should take to mitigate the impact of feminism on young men. It might even have asked whether Lapine's accusations against feminism had any basis. But already in 1990, sorry, 1989, all of that was out of the question. Instead, as signaled in its title, The War Against Women, the report, finalized in June 1991, fully accepted the feminist interpretation. 
Issuing more than two dozen recommendations, the report aimed to put violence against women on the public agenda and to implement or extend feminist goals. And many of these had little, if anything, to do with Lapine's crime. They included, for example, mandating gender sensitivity training for all students, as well as for police, judges, members of parliament, and the public. The report also called for continuous funding of domestic violence and sexual assault initiatives, especially for frontline agencies providing services to assaulted and abused women and girls. The report didn't recommend any services for assaulted and abused men and boys, services that are still largely absent today. Many of the policies recommended in the report disregarded and overrode basic principles of justice for accused men, including the presumption of innocence. The report called for the federal government to stress the importance of mandatory charging policies in cases of physical and sexual assault and abuse, whereby police must charge a man accused of violence even in the absence of evidence. The report also called for judges to be granted the right, quote, to remove a man charged with assaulting his spouse from the family home, end quote. This latter recommendation has meant in practice that any man can be removed from his home at any time subsequent to an accusation and a mandatory charge of domestic violence. A major thrust of the report had nothing to do with violence, focusing instead on so-called equality-enhancing legislation. In one of its more incongruous formulations, it stipulated that amateur sports organizations, quote, eliminate barriers to the full participation of girls, end quote, as if that had anything to do with an act of mass violence. The report's commissioning illustrated the willingness of the government under pressure from feminist organizations to endorse a grab bag of anti-male assumptions and policies that have shaped law and policy for decades. The government also moved to enshrine the Montreal massacre in public memory within a feminist framework. Within two years, December 6 became officially a day of remembrance and action on violence against women. And in time, this was expanded to the 16 days of activism against violence against women. Universities across Canada have commemorated the event with memorial gatherings and displays sometimes spread over multiple days and usually attended by university presidents and other top-level officials. At these gatherings, participants read the names of the dead, make speeches about men unlearning toxic masculinity, and enact rituals of angry mourning. Over time, the emphasis of the day has been modified to reflect shifts in feminist thinking, especially the turn toward intersectionality with its emphasis on multiple interlocking forms of oppression, such as racism, white supremacy, Western imperialism, homophobia, and Islamophobia. The Status of Women Canada webpage about the massacre affirms its commitment to fight misogyny with an expansive revised definition. It says, quote, in Canada and around the world, women, girls, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirit, and gender diverse individuals face unacceptable violence and discrimination, end quote. Only heterosexual men are excluded from the list of those whose experience of violence is considered unacceptable. Many commentators at more recent December 6 vigils have stressed the suffering of indigenous, Muslim, or colonized women, sometimes hardly focusing on Lapine's unfashionably white victims at all. A memorial event at Ryerson University in 2019, for example, featured Serene Fox, an Indigenous television personality who spoke on, quote, gender-based violence, colonization, and Indigenous genocide in Canada. The University of Toronto Mississauga campus marked December 6 in that same year by donating wellness kits to Nisa Homes, a transition house specifically for Muslim women and children. The webpage was silent about the fact that Lapine had been abused by his Muslim father. Very few commentators still have explored the very awkward mismatch between Lapine and the feminist theory of male power. 
In 2015, the executive director of the Women's Center at the University of Regina, Jill Arnott, did note in interview that, quote, the shooter grew up in an abusive home, a fact showing she said that, quote, violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. But the rest of the article said nothing more on that theme. Queen's University professor Karen Dubinsky took a different tack in 2009, focusing on the allegation by Lapine's mother that her ex-husband had fought in the Algerian War of Independence and had been tortured by French colonial forces. This focus recast the father, and Lapine by extension, not as an exemplar of toxic masculinity, but as a victim of Western imperial violence. And under this interpretation, Lapine was no longer blamed as a privileged white man as he had been privileged, uh, as he had been previously. But still, privileged white men were ultimately responsible for his violence. This rather convoluted interpretation has not caught on generally. More recently, and in line with a fashionable new feminist target, Lapine has been dubbed an incel killer, allegedly enraged by his involuntary celibacy and motivated by the imputed belief that men should have by rights unfettered access to women's bodies, as feminists tell us. Self-declared incels who express their sexual frustration in online communities, they're perhaps the most vilified men in our society today. A small minority of these men have committed mass murder, though not exclusively of women. And there's no evidence that Lapine acted out of sexual frustration, but that hasn't stopped commentators from conscripting him for their anti-male narrative. A 2000 article on incel killers mentioned Lapine and quoted feminist activist Julie Lalonde, saying that he and the others were, quote, fascinated or obsessed with the idea of being a real man and concluding oh so predictably that, quote, masculinity is at the heart of mass murdering. The suggestion by Lalonde seemed to be that the way to end male violence is to give men even fewer opportunities than they now have to express masculinity. Men's only approved role in relation to the Montreal Massacre has remained constant over these many years. They must accept their shameful affiliation with Lapine and work unceasingly for women's advancement. At many Montreal Massacre commemorations, male students reiterate men's obligation to stop consenting to women's oppression. In sum, the story of the Montreal Massacre is a microcosm of feminist warping of reality for ideological ends. The truth is that Lapine did not kill because he was socialized into machismo by a woman-hating culture or taught that he should control women. There is ample evidence that men's violence like women's is caused by multiple factors such as mental illness, addictions, stress, and family of origin abuse. Although it is impossible to know Lapine's mind, we can plausibly speculate that if he thought much about his masculinity, it was to note that Canadian society, like other societies, had little use for unsuccessful men and was indifferent to or even contemptuous of men's troubles. Like many young men, Lapine sought meaning and identity in traditionally masculine spheres, first the military, then sciences, computing, engineering, only to fail, and in the midst of his failure to be told he must embrace the promotion of women at the expense of his own opportunities. Then as now, he would have been well aware that any public criticism of women or of feminism was impermissible, while mass denunciations of men were perfectly acceptable. The Montreal Massacre anniversaries have become a state-sanctioned occasion, not primarily for remembering the women killed, but for vengeful anti-male posturing. For the men looking on, the message has been clear for decades. No matter how many men die in Canada and around the world, whether through suicide or violence or in loving self-sacrifice, there will never be a day sanctioned to honor them. Even November 11th war memorials, as Lapine indicated, have been equalized. While men's historical and contemporary sacrifices for their societies are ignored, even while they're expected, the bad behavior of some few men is magnified out of all proportion and made every man's responsibility. It's far from clear 
that we can ever end violence against women, though the utopian premise conveniently justifies increasingly radical anti-male initiatives. But if we are serious about reducing violence, we could start by acknowledging that male victimization is equally tragic, and we could seek to understand rather than demonize those abject figures like Lapine whose toxic masculinity we love to hate.